All right, it's a coronavirus pandemic, so let's talk about death. Um, this section uh, has a couple of um, there's a, a couple of things I want to stress in this particular section. Uh, on the face of it, it's about killing and when and where it might be justified. Uh, killing, of course, is an important moral issue. It's one of the things that we say, uh, certainly killing innocent people is, in general, forbidden. Uh, it's one of the Ten Commandments, it de uh, usually. It depends whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Jewish, how you number them, but uh, it refers to, uh, in the John Harris article, it refers to the Sixth Commandment. I don't know if that's the Protestant numbering or, or whatever. But thou shalt not kill is the usual reading of that. Um, and it doesn't have exceptions. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill except in these circumstances. It just says thou shalt not kill. So, you know, the Ten Commandments are usually held up as very important, and there it is amongst, amongst them. And it, in general, it's seen as one of the worst things that you can do. Um, so, a challenge for theories of morality is to explain why that might be so. This is an important moral fact. Killing is wrong, or at least killing innocent people is wrong. And uh, it needs to be justified in terms of your theory. Um, a theory that I've been mentioning a lot in these lectures is utilitarianism, which again is a consequentialist theory. That is, it says whether or not an action or policy is right depends on its effects, depends on what consequences come from it. So if lying brings about the best consequences in a particular circumstance, then you should lie. If it doesn't, then you shouldn't, that kind of thing. Um, and obviously, bringing about someone's death is fairly, fairly severe. And uh, utilitarianism isn't just a consequentialist theory. It says that the consequences should be ranked in order of how much happiness they bring about. Now, there are different utilitarian positions depending on how they interpret happiness. For example, um, Singer who was mentioned in the Mylan Engels vegetarianism piece, Peter Singer, talks about maximizing satisfaction of preferences. Um, whereas a more simplistic, or simple early version of utilitarianism that I mentioned before, Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, says that we should maximize pleasure for those people affected. And in general, it's considered that if you kill someone, they're incapable of feeling happiness or pleasure ever again. So you've caused a fairly great net loss of happiness to the world. Now, uh, utilitarianism is often criticized by people who disagree with it by use of some cases where utilitarianism gives one answer and our intuitions go the other way. Our intuitions um, say that that is the wrong answer to give and that therefore utilitarianism must be the wrong theory. In general, um, Mylan Engel, in the article on vegetarianism, mentioned um, uh, mentioned something mentioned a term that you might have come across and wondered what it meant, which was reflective equilibrium. This is a term uh, popularized by the philosopher John Rawls. I've forgotten the guy who um, who first coined the term. Uh, another famous philosopher, but. Uh, I'm going senile, so I've forgotten him. Um, the, uh, oh, Goodman, Nelson Goodman, that's it. Reflective equilibrium is the idea that we have our moral theory, and then we have a set of moral claims that we say any moral theory has to agree with. And then we kind of balance them out. Like, for example, suppose one of our moral claims is it's always wrong to kill. And suppose our moral theory, which we like otherwise, which gets the right answer in most cases, uh, allows some exception to that rule. We can either say, no, nope, there is no exception to the, the, this rule, so therefore the moral theory has been proven inadequate, we must get a new moral theory. 
or we can say, um, well, maybe our intuitions are a little crude. Maybe we need to make them more subtle. Maybe we need to say that killing is not always wrong. Killing is wrong in most circumstances. And then, or we can say, well, maybe if we make some adjustments to our theory, it will agree more with our intuition. So basically, we try to bring our moral theory and our intuitions into line. So reflect. this is by sort of, it's kind of like a negotiation between our uh, moral claims and our theory, or whichever one it was which. I can't remember what, what each hand represented. And we try to bring them uh, close together. Uh, sometimes if you're a hardcore utilitarian, you say, well, the theory's right, so any intuitions that disagree with it, they must just be wrong, and I'm going to argue against those intuitions. And that's kind of what happens in the uh, article by John Harris, The Survival Lottery, that you've also read for this section. Because there, uh, as you see at the end, the one of the last cases mentioned in the Philosophy Files uh, chapter on killing is the transplant case. And that's what the whole of the... Um, uh, the Harris article, The Survival Lottery, is about. It's about a, survival, it's about, uh, a transplant case. And in the um, philosophy files, the utilitarian conclusion that it makes sense to kill an innocent person to save the two people who need organs, that's considered as outrageous. So that therefore, because utilitarianism gives this result and we disagree with it, Therefore, utilitarianism is wrong. But what happens in the survival lottery is that you get Y and Z, or as John Harris would say, Y and Z, because that's how we say uh, the last letter of the alphabet over the pun, and in Canada. Canada agrees with us. It really ruins the alphabet song because it doesn't rhyme. But anyway, I'll say Y and Z. Y and Z argue back. They're the people who need... Um, organs, uh, and they suggest an ingenious sort of workaround. Uh, and they challenge you, instead of just saying, oh, that's outrageous, we couldn't do that, they push back and point out, well, wait a minute, what you're suggesting isn't really any better. And what you're suggesting also requires us to abandon uh, very firmly held moral beliefs. So, you know, it's not like the right is obviously on the side of rejecting the transplant. So it's an interesting case, and it's an interesting, it's kind of a, it's a bit like when we read Berkeley, and Berkeley argues uh, that, you know, there are no, there is no material substance. Everybody disagrees with him, but he has pretty good arguments. Same thing's going on here, only, uh, you know, how seriously does Harris mean this? Well, even if he, doesn't necessarily agree with Y and Z, he still wants to challenge our sort of smugly held assumptions about how we're we're okay. And also he wants to attack a, a distinction um, that is often given that it is wrong to kill, but it is not wrong to allow to die. And utilitarians in general have a problem with this distinction because of course Utilitarians focus on the consequences of an action. And in both cases, whether or not I kill or let someone die, the consequences are the same. The person dies. Um, so there is very little uh, consequential difference between the two. The people who see a difference tend to be uh, people like Kantians, where it's what I, it's my intentions that are important. And the intentions are, are different in the case of killing and letting and die. But utilitarians say, what, what difference does it make to the person who dies? And you know that they're going to die in both cases. And you do something that is consistent with them ending up dead. When you could have done something that would have meant that they were alive. Uh, what's the difference, says the utilitarian. All right, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But... Uh, let's start with Stephen Law, where Stephen Law starts, which is talking about the uh, the death penalty, capital punishment. Um, Michigan 
has never had the death penalty. Michigan is one of the few, it might even be the only, I'm not sure, uh, but it's certainly one of the few uh, US states that never had it. A lot of states had it and uh, gave it up. And in fact, all US states that had it, had it suspended for a period because the Supreme Court decided that the um, that capital punishment as practiced in the United States violated the constitutional clause against cruel and unusual punishment. I can't remember. It's one of the amendments. I don't have to know. I guess I do because I'm a citizen now, but I passed the test, so I guess I don't have to know. But uh, there is a constitutional um, rule against cruel and unusual punishment. And it was decided by the Supreme Court, which was much more liberal in those days. Uh, the, the current Supreme Court would never do this. Uh, it was decided that the way the, uh, the capital punishment was instituted in this country violated that clause because uh, of racial injustice. Basically, they pointed to the fact that African Americans in particular, but basically all non-whites, were executed at a much higher rate um, for the same crimes as uh, whites were. So therefore, there was something unjust going on, and therefore, we had to suspend executions until this was sorted out. And all death penalties were banned for a period of years, into the 70s, I think. Uh, the first person to be executed um, to end this period when there were no executions was a guy called Gary Gilmore in Utah. And he demanded to be executed by firing squad, which is still allowed in Utah. You could choose your method of execution. So Gary Gilmore was the first person famously to be killed in a number of years uh, and by firing squad. Uh, and, you know, they made some changes to various laws and gradually it got reinstituted in a bunch of states. Um, but the useful thing about this is that it provided a number, a, an amount of data that you could use for, so you could look at, say, California in a period when it didn't have the death penalty and compare it with California and in a period when it did, or you could take Texas when it didn't have the death penalty and compare it with Texas when it did. So um, you don't just, you're, you can't just uh, compare, say, the US with Canada. Does Canada have the death penalty? I don't think it does. Or, or with the UK, which hasn't had the death penalty since the early 60s. Um, you, you, you know, you can say, for example, we have a much, much lower murder rate in the United Kingdom than uh, we have over here in the States, uh, which is kind of damaging to the claim that having the death penalty deters people from committing capital crimes because the death penalty is attached to murder in the United States, not in Britain, and yet there are many more murders in the United States. What people could say is, uh, oh, you can't compare the two. There's different populations in the United Kingdom and, and America. But if you're comparing California to California, you can't really uh, make that excuse because it's the same state. And it turned out that there was no evidence to show that the death penalty was any deterrent. And some people argue, in fact, it was the opposite. Uh, but anyway, death, that's the, a little bit of historical background on the death penalty. Um, a lot of people like the idea of the death penalty. And certainly, in fact, we all do in some respects. I think somebody put together a compilation. I noticed this because I've had I have children and they have watched over the years many a Disney movie and the number of times that the villain in a Disney movie Disney movie dies horribly is you know you lose count like uh, they're always falling off things like in Tangled or Hunchback of Notre Dame or Beauty and the ba Beast they're always falling to their death so you get to watch their screaming face as they go down uh, Snow White the, the witch falls off a cliff and then the vultures descend slowly to feast on her, the implication is. 
pretty grisly. So this is what we feed our children, the idea that villains should die horribly. Uh, and we get off on it. Clearly there's something about us that uh, is, ha is retributivist. That is, we like the idea of the bad guys getting theirs. And this includes, in just about every Disney movie, death. Um, so something about us is a fan of the death penalty. But what should we take from this? Well, one suggestion is that uh, the idea of an eye for an eye. This is sometimes called the principle of lex talionis. And people can point to the Old Testament where the phrase comes from, uh, at least the English translation, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now, I believe it was Gandhi who said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth leaves the whole world blind and toothless. Uh, the implication being that it's not a good policy. Uh, it, it does harm on those who perform ex executions as much as the people killed. It debases them in some way. Uh, but also it's true, as it points out in the Love article, that uh, the New Testament explicitly goes against that uh, and says that vengeance should be the Lord's doing and that we shouldn't go about killing people. So just appealing to the, Bi the Old Testament is, uh, well, that's okay if you're Jewish, I guess, but if you're Christian, you believe the New Testament um, tr uh, trumps, uh, replaces the rules, or at least overrides some of the rules of the Old Testament, because that's the point of Jesus coming. Um, so, the idea of lex talionis is proportional punishment. And actually, it was a fairly liberal policy in the Old Testament, because the punishment system that it was advising against was one where disproportionate punishment was in place. That is, you could be executed for stealing a loaf of bread. So the point of the whole eye for an eye business is saying, no, you shouldn't punish more than the uh, crime warranted, that the punishment should not be worse than the crime. So it was to set an upper limit on punishment, not to say that punishment should be exactly this. At least that's what some Bible scholars say. So, um, even if you cite an eye for an eye, that doesn't mean that we have to do exactly what the uh, criminals suggest. I mean, that's as if we as a civilized society are manipulated by the criminals. And we don't believe it anyway, because, you know, there are some criminals who've done horrific things, who've raped and murdered, ra raped and tortured their victims over a number of weeks. And we don't say, therefore, we have to rape and torture them to death, you know, it, it would be kind of odd advertising for an official rapist, right? If we, if the uh, criminal has to get what they did, then you have to, uh, you have to employ someone who will rape the rapist and torture the torturer. And I'm not sure we'd like, I'm not sure we'd like it if people responded to those want ads very keenly. So we don't even believe that, uh, we should do exactly to the criminal what the criminal did, because we don't apply it to torture and things like that. I mean, we used to. There used to be um, punishments, hanging, drawing, and quartering. Uh, drawing is when they pulled out your entrails while you were alive. That was a punishment. Quartering is when they attached a horse to each of your four limbs and had them trot off in, in opposite directions. So you were literally pulled apart by horses. That was a punishment. These are actual official punishments that were put into effect. So we used to do stuff like that. And we don't anymore because we got more civilized. At least that's the idea. Um, and maybe, and certainly uh, European countries think that the death penalty is uncivilized and that we should progress beyond that as well. All right, so what are some other arguments for the death penalty? One of the most famous is, of course, deterrence. This is deterrence as a justification for punishment says that the point of punishment is not backward looking. So the retributivist theory of punishment says Punishment is in direct response to the crime. So whatever the criminal do, did, you should do the same to them. We've looked at that. 
The alternative view is to say, no, the point of punishment is not backward looking. It's not looking at the crime. It's forward looking. It's using punishment to make society better. So deterrence, the point of deterrence is to, as the name implies, deter uh, future crimes. So uh, the punishment of, uh, we, we justify the death penalty to deter um, future criminals. So we execute, you know, what it was, Dick Rotten or whatever the, the name uh, Stephen Law uses uh, as a lesson to um, to the to the future people who are contemplating but it's kind of like uh, farmers putting up a dead crow to scare away other crows you know let this be a lesson to the crows uh, this is what will happen to you if you eat my crops um, say so that's the same idea here so now that would be a utilitarian justification because a utilitarian would say if it brings about more happiness and in terms of fewer murders then it's justified so if it worked utilitarians would be all in favor of uh, the death penalty as deterrence because of course the utilitarians don't have absolute prohibitions on anything killing is only wrong insofar as it brings about bad uh, consequences and of course it will always bring about the death of the person you kill and that's a bad consequence in itself because they they will never have any future happiness so that makes it likely that killing uh, has to have a very positive effect on other people to justify it well if deterrence works then um, then it could justify it the only trouble is whether or not deterrence works is a, an issue for science and studies to work out and you have to compare you know states where there's the death penalty to similar states where there is not the death penalty and look at the murder rate and so on which is what i was getting about to earlier which is why the moratorium on the death penalty that ended in the 70s is very useful for people wanting to study this thing and what do they find out they find out that the death penalty doesn't deter. Well, that seems weird. Why wouldn't it deter? I mean, here's, here's what I always say in, in this discussion. I bet I know where the death penalty would work as a deterrent. It doesn't seem to work as a deterrent for murder, but I bet it would work as a deterrent for jaywalking. If we executed jaywalkers, I bet that would solve jaywalking. Why? Because I think jaywalking is something where uh, you do it because you don't think you're going to get punished. You don't think even if you get caught, you'll get punished. And you think that it's worth the risk because you won't get, you'll just get told off at, at worst. Whereas if you are literally killed for jaywalking, I think that would really affect your calculation. So I think that's where deterrence would work. But of course, then we say, you can't execute jaywalkers. That's wildly out of proportion, which is where Lex Talionis comes in again. So why doesn't it work for murder? And I, I think what uh, Law says is perfectly commonsensical. Murders tend to be unplanned. They tend to be committed by, and even when they're planned, nobody plans on getting caught. So they don't think they're going to get caught. If you're doing something that serious, you know the punishment is going to be serious anyway, and you don't think, well, I'll just take it. I'll just take a prison sentence. Um, you just plan on not getting caught. And if you're not going to get caught, then the punish whatever the punishment is, is irrelevant to you. Uh, now, there's some indication that um, death penalty actually makes the murder rate worse. Why? Well, maybe it's that... Uh, our government setting the example that killing is okay is a bad example and it's kind of debasing on the citizens. I don't know. Who knows? These are the kind of things that sociologists and political scientists study. Okay, but one thing you can say about executing a murderer is that will, it will stop that murderer from ever killing again. Uh, that is certainly true. But again, um, there are other ways to stop them. They're, uh, you know, you can keep them in prison. And people think that actually keeping people in prison is vastly more expensive than the death penalty. Actually, they're wrong about that. The death penalty is enormously expensive. 
having a death penalty case can bankrupt a small district. So if you have a small uh, district and one uh, and there's a murder that becomes a death penalty case, that can bankrupt a small legal system because of the constitutional protections that allow you to appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, of course, people then say, well, get rid of, rid of the appeals. But already, with the appeals, this long process, we've executed innocent people. There's something called the Innocence Project, uh, which where it takes on the cases of people on death row and the number of people that the Innocence Project has exonerated, has proved, did not do the crime that they're going to be executed for, is quite substantial. And this is even with the whole process of appeals. So it turns out we have a very flawed legal system. And if we have a death penalty, we kill innocent people. Innocent people have been killed. That's the Innocence Project doesn't tend to look into the cases of people who've been executed because they want, they've want they got limited resources and they want to try and save people's lives if they're innocent. But other people have done investigation on people who've been executed and found out they didn't do it. So we've killed innocent people. And isn't that the, the, the worst thing to do? Isn't that why we think that the death penalty is appropriate? Because uh, killing innocent people is so bad. Um... All right, so that's the death penalty. In general, I I don't know what the current mood is on the death penalty. I think I think the mood is turning against the death penalty in this country. But again, it could turn the other way just as quickly. Uh, but the arguments for it, and maybe it's just because Stephen Law and I are British, and we come from a country, uh, they've never had the death penalty in my lifetime, and I'm old. Uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's just the idea of people being executed by the state is just bizarre to us. So maybe that's part of it. Uh, but in general, looking at the arguments, they don't seem to be good. Okay. Now, uh, after talking about the death penalty, Stephen Law goes on to talk about other cases of killing, uh, killing people. And... The first one is self-defense. Now there, of course, we would say that it's not necessarily innocent people that are killed. But sometimes it can be. Sometimes uh, you can need to kill people um, in sa to save yourself when it's no fault of those people. And in fact, he brings up uh, several cases like this. Um, so we'll look at cases where the, uh, where you are called on to kill someone in order to save them. In, in each of these cases, it seems very likely that utilitarianism would say, not only is it okay to kill the individual, but you have a moral duty to do it. You have to. You would be a bad person if you didn't do it, which is a very strong claim to make. So let's look at these cases. The first one is... He calls it the Grand Vizier case, but this is actually based on a famous example given by a philosopher, a British philosopher who died about 10 years ago, Bernard Williams. Uh, and he used it as an example uh, to use against utilitarianism, because he says utilitarianism says you absolutely have to uh, kill the person. So basically the idea is uh, you're captured and you're given this opportunity. If you just shoot one of the other, captive, uh, other captives, the others will go free. But if you refuse to shoot them, shoot one, they'll all be killed. Now, of course, this is very unfair on you, because, of course, you didn't do anything wrong. Uh, you didn't capture these people. But, of course, it's even more unfair on the people about to be shot. Uh, now, what Bernard Williams says is you shouldn't be required to shoot it. You shouldn't be regarded as a bad person if you say, I'm not going to shoot anybody, with the result that far more people get killed. Because, of course, it's not you doing the killing. What a utilitarian says is, yeah, it's not your fault. Of course, it's a terrible thing, a terrible situation that you've been put in. But once you're in it, you have to kill them. Because otherwise, 
as a result of your squeamishness, as a result of your standing on principle, many people die who didn't have to. Again, they're murdered by somebody else, but you could have prevented it. So this is where a consequentialist theory says, if you can bring about, if you can affect the consequences, and you have a chance to affect the consequences so that more people live, then you have to, even if it requires of you that you kill someone. Of course, this is going to make you miserable, presumably, unless you're some kind of sicko. Uh, you don't want to shoot anybody. It goes against everything that you stand for. But, and it's a horrible thing for your captors, the wargs, I think they are in Stephen Law's example, to make you do. But those are the breaks. Uh, and when you're in that situation, you have to do it. Uh, so again, this is sort of a challenge for utilitarianism, depending on where your intuitions go. Uh, some people say that this proves that Bernard Williams clearly intended for this to show that utilitarianism just doesn't work, because utilitarianism says the answer is absolutely clear. You have to kill one to save the others. And he wants to say that's not absolutely clear. Uh, second example, the astronaut, where you have to make a choice and saving one astronaut automatically kills the other. Whereas if you don't do anything, they both die. Again, this is sometimes used by utilitarians to say that killing is the same as letting die. Uh, and in fact, um, if you let both of them die, you're a worse person. So again, the utilitarian says you have to pick one. It doesn't matter which one, except, well, maybe you should pick the one who's more likely to have a longer and happier life afterwards. But uh, you got to pick, and you can't just stay there and say, ah, and watch them both die. Whereas uh, somebody who's committed to this principle that uh, it is wrong to kill, but it's not necessarily wrong to allow to die, that there's a big moral difference, would say, oh, well, then it's okay to let them die, because at least you're not killing anyone. And utilitarian said, K -k 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 -k. grow up. Sometimes you have to kill people. Get used to it. Uh, it's the morally right thing to do. Um, then we have the great glue example. Uh, that one is also an adaptation of a famous uh, example from philosophical history. Oh, did I skip over one? I skipped over the... Um, Oh, that's right. I skipped over the submarine case. Yeah, the submarine case is where uh, a nuclear submarine is, there's a fault in it, and it will set off warheads, killing millions of people, uh, and the only way to stop it happening is to sink the submarine, which will kill all the crew, which who, who have done nothing wrong, and they are, in fact, heroes for volunteering to this dangerous mission for their country. Do you have to do it? Most people would say, yes, you have to do it. Um, like, for example, uh, I don't know if you know this, you were born after 9-11, right? Probably most of you. God, that makes me feel old. Um, it, during 9-11, they mobilized the Air Force to shoot down any more passenger jets. If the passenger jets were seen to be heading for, you know, big population centers, then the Air Force was going to shoot down the passenger jets, which, of course, involved killing everybody on board uh, to save the cities, to save the, the more people who would die. Because, of course, a lot more people died in the Twin Towers than on the actual planes. So if you could have... Uh, and, of course, Flight 93 was brought down by the hero passengers on board. So that was supposedly headed for the White House or something. And the passengers stormed the cockpit and crashed the plane, sacrificing themselves to save uh, probably thousands of people. Um, but of course, if they hadn't have done it and the Air Force would have, could have got to them, they would have shot the plane down anyway, which is very similar to this uh, submarine case. Um, and I think utilitarians say, yeah, obviously you have to do it. And that seems a case where our intuitions agree with the utilitarians. The great glue one is the caving example where, um, who is it? Uh, some, some guy gets uh, caught in the entrance to the cave. Yes, Ned gets uh, his, stuck in the entrance to the cave. 
uh, and the water is rising and um, people will drown. And the only way to get him out of the house, the cave, is to cut him into pieces and then remove him. Uh, now, he's not going to die. He's going to eventually get use, loose. You could dig him out eventually um, without him dying. But if you do that, the people in the cave are going to die. Um, and uh, so it's basically him or them. But you have to actively kill him. And he wouldn't die otherwise. What do you do there? Now, there, Law says it's less clear because here's someone who would live unless you did something. Um, but that's true of the people in the submarine, too. They would survive. The missiles would leave and start World War III, and they probably wouldn't even notice. Uh, so we've already killed innocent people in the other cases. Why is this so different? Then, of course, he brings up the transplant case, which is very similar to what's happening with Y and Z in the uh, survival lottery. So I'll get to that in a second. And finally, he leaves us with the conjoined twins. Uh, one thing Ben Carson is famous for, our current HUD secretary and former presidential candidate, is he operated on conjoined twins and separated them. And I know at least one of them died, and the other one might have uh, had um, paralysis as a result. But he, he operated on that, and it's seen as a sign of his, his skill. Uh, but I don't think the outcomes were great either way. Um, you could look that up. That's one of the things that he was famous for before he became a politician. He, he is literally a brain surgeon. Um, but yes, conjoined twins is an uh, actual case where if you separate them, uh, if you don't separate them, they'll both die. And if you do separate them, one will die. Uh, now, the Catholics parents didn't want to operate because the Catholic parents were committed to the principle that it is wrong to kill, but it is not wrong to allow to die. Operating would have meant killing one of them. Uh, Jody, I think it was. Uh, or was it Mary? There were Mary and Jody, and um, Jody was bright and alert, but Mary only had a rudimentary brain. Yes, Mary gets killed. And Jody survives. Uh, they did the the uh, hospital overrode the wishes of the parents and said we can't allow Jody to die just because of these parents' principles. It is our duty to save Jody, and we believe we are justified in operating and thereby killing Mary to save Jody. And they did. Were they wrong? That's the question. Um, all right, now I'm going to talk about the uh, survival lottery. And this is a very ingenious uh, thought experiment because it's an expansion of the uh, a case just like the transplant case that, um, that Law talks about, except that instead of just accepting their fate and saying, you know, oh, of course, we can't operate on, an, on somebody we can't kill an innocent person to save you, Y and Z come up with all of these uh, suggestions. So first of all, they their first objection is that um, they uh, that there is no moral difference between killing and letting die, and that therefore, uh, by not operating, you are, allow you are allowing two people to die, clearly by not operating. Now remember the background to this is that this is not necessarily our society where transplant cases are still imperfect. This is, let's assume that transplant technology is perfect. So that it's just like having your own lungs or kidneys and or heart even and uh, they have perfectly good um, uh, survival chances, that they, they will live as long as the healthy person that is killed. So it's not like, because of course if they have shorter lives, then a utilitarian would say, nah, 
the one guy was going to have more total happiness than the two of them put together because they only live a short time with their transplanted organs. Let's rule that out already and say that um, that they will have a longer life. They will have as long a life as the uh, the person who is taken and dissected for his or her organs. Uh, and there's two of them, so that will be twice the amount of total lifetime uh, than you would have otherwise. Now, of course, a utilitarian could still object to this procedure if it was just done, uh, the, if it was done the wrong way. For example, if it meant, you know, the way we got, uh, let me give you a, 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 an analogy. There's a famous pair of, well, they started out as grave robbers, called Burke and Hare. And these were famous in Victorian Scotland, I believe, because uh, I think it was in Edinburgh. Edinburgh in Scotland had, had one of the top, and still does, one of the top medical universities in the world. And at the time, I think it was the best. And uh, they pioneered the use of cadavers in medical school because they figured that you should operate on actual humans to learn how to operate on actual humans. Now, this was very shocking and controversial at the time because it, that was seen as desecrating the dead. So it was very difficult to get hold of corpses to practice on. So there was sort of this underground uh, trade in, in body snatching that they would, Burke and Hare, they would pay these people, the, the medical school would pay disreputable characters to bring them fresh corpses. And it started with grave robbing. So Burke and Hare would hang around after the funeral, wait till it got dark and dig up the freshly buried corpse and sell it to the medical school. But then they went on to, they couldn't get enough corpses that way. So they started killing poor people, you know, hanging around in, in uh, slums and basically finding people that nobody would miss and bumping them up and providing them as very fresh corpses. Okay, so if we had something like that, utilitarians would not be in favor of this. Uh, if, you know, you knew that, you know, just walking down the street could get you killed for all your organs, or, you know, the, the famous urban legends of where you, you get drunk in Las Vegas and then you wake up in a, bar in a bath of ice with a, the note saying, call 911, your kidneys have been taken. Um, you know, that would be bad. So what Y and Z suggest is a lottery system. A lottery system where it's just at random. It's not, you know, people taken off the street. Everybody is entered into the lottery, and uh, if your name comes up, you should give yourself up to be um, to be dissected for your organs. And of course, if we do this on a societal wide scale, one person could save so many people. I mean, uh, think of all the things they could trans transplant. They could transplant your pancreas, they could transplant your lungs, your kidneys, your heart, you know, you got two lungs, so one lung could save one person, another lung could save another person, your heart saves another person, your kidneys save another person, your liver saves another person, your corneas uh, give sight to somebody who was already blind, all this kind of thing. One person could do so much. Um, now, of course, you wouldn't like to hear the knock on the door saying, you know, congratulations, you've been chosen. Um, but you could get used to it. And actually, <laughs> there's an analogy to this that just came up in the news. Uh, President Trump apparently, well, not apparently, he actually has, has, has started making noises that we've got to go back to work. That, uh, you know, this has gone on long enough. The economy is tanking. We're going to go back to work. After three weeks, he said, we're going to review it. He says, we mustn't have the cure for the coronavirus be worse than the disease. The cure being the stock market going, I'm sorry, the worse being the stock market collapsing. So what he and several members uh, on the right of the Republican Party are suggesting is that we should stop all this um, quarantining nonsense and get back to work, get the economy going again. And in keeping with this, one of uh, his pals, uh, is it Falwell? Yeah, 
is it Falwell who's in charge of um, uh, Liberty University in, I think it's North Carolina. Uh, it's a very fundamentally religious school and he's opened it again and said, everybody come back, business as usual. Now, he has admitted, he admitted at the news conference yesterday, this is President Trump, that uh, somebody asked, is this what the doctors are suggesting? Because Anthony Fauci was um, was not notably absent from this news conference. He says, is this what the doctors are recommending? And Trump said, if it was up to the doctors, we would stay quarantined. So basically he's saying, you have got to sacrifice your old people who are going to die, uh, have to sacrifice for the good of the economy. And uh, these people are coming out on Twitter and said, I would gladly give my life to save our economy from going into recession. Uh, well, that's the kind of attitude we want from the survival lottery. The survival lottery, we should encourage people to think that it is an honor to be taken uh, for the survival lottery. And if we encourage that, then, you know, like it's an honor to have one's child be killed at war. or So people sign up for the military. Um, if we encourage that kind of attitude, then uh, people would be totally okay with the survival lottery. And the result is, Everybody, everybody's life expectancy goes up. So even, of, of course, some people, they're cut short in their prime because they get chosen by the lottery. But on average, everybody has a much better chance of living. So your chances of living to a ripe old age get much higher because, and you can look up statistics, uh, the number of people who die waiting for transplants in this country is, is a lot. A lot of people die on the waiting list. Whereas if we had the lottery, there would be no waiting list. Everybody would get the organs they need. Um, I mean, one of the things that uh, that is particularly difficult about hearts is you have to get hearts still beating. You can't store hearts frozen. Some organs you can, like kidney, you can store frozen for a while. But hearts, literally, the person has to be pretty much alive, their heart has to be still beating very shortly before it's put into the chest of someone who dies, uh, someone who needs it. It can't stop beating for a long period of time. So you have to like whip it from helicopter by helicopter. So normally the hearts from transplant, uh, the hearts that are given for transplant are taken off people who are brain dead, but their hearts are still beating. So they have to say in their um, living will or their relatives have to say, yes, this person wanted to give their heart. And so they are not technically dead yet when the hearts are removed because otherwise the heart would be useless. This system would ensure that everybody gets a heart if they need it. Um, now, of course, if you can invent artificial organs, great, you don't need this system. But let's assume we haven't got to that point yet. Uh, now. What's wrong with this? Um, and the ingeniousness of the survival lottery is Y and Z grad go through each of the objections and knock them down. So the first objection is that this is at the top of page, the second column on page 680, is that it might favor old people over the young because uh, more old people are going to need this, these transplants. Um, well, we can write a program, a computer program. This is in the 70s, so pretty um, advanced thinking by, uh, by Harris to know that you could write an algorithm. Algorithms do everything these days. We could write a computer program that uh, weighted it right, so it came to whatever we, we thought was right. All right, more serious objections starting at the bottom of uh, the second column on page 680. It reduces our security. Our first straw to clutch at would be the desire for security. Under such a scheme, we would never know when we would hear them knocking on the door. But the ch uh, in response, the chances of actually being called upon might be slimmer than the, is the present risk of being killed on the roads, and possibly slimmer, and, and almost certainly slimmer than uh, the chance of dying because one of our organs fails. Um, so as soon as we educate people into that, we'll be okay. Of course, what Harris did not foresee is 
the internet and there would always be, just as there are anti-vaxxers now, I mean, vaccination is the most sensible and simple and system of saving lives possibly ever invented. And there are still crazy people who are opposed to it and, uh, and have caused a measles resurgence. So imagine what those people would do with the, um, with the survival logic. And actually trending on Twitter yesterday was a phrase that we haven't seen for ages since the days of Sarah Palin. Um, which is death panels. And death panels was a scare term drummed up by opponents of universal health care. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was the first lady, was put in charge of instituting something like a universal health care, or at least the first steps towards it, uh, back in the 90s. And it was completely tanked by right-wing attacks, um, funded, of course, by insurance agencies. Uh, among other people. And one of the, the scare tactics they used was this idea that healthcare would be rationed, that there would be panels to decide who lives and who dies. What uh, Y and Z would say is, well, that happens anyway. You're deciding that we're going to die. What the, This trades on the idea that unless we institute this, then the, there's no uh, blood on our hands. That the you know the the universal health care is bad because people decide who lives and who dies. But YNZ says that happens anyway. All that it, uh, the the way it happens in the United States is that poor people die because they can't afford health care. We've made that decision, and isn't that objectionable? Um, you're suggesting, of course, that there's in a place where there's limited resources, you have to decide. We have this much money in the hospital. Do we spend it on a kidney machine or do we spend it on a, a million vaccinations? Do we spend it on a di you know, dialysis or, uh, or a ventilator? We're going to run out of ventilators very quickly um, because of, well, we didn't need as much before the coronavirus. Um, probably needed them, haven't needed as many since polio was a, uh, was a thing. But uh, you have to make rationing decisions. That's just a fact. And nobody can avoid it. The only way you think you're avoiding it is if you say, well, if we just let everyone die, then we won't have any blood on our hands. But uh, if you um, attack the distinction between killing and letting die, then you can't, uh, you, you can no longer claim to be free of making decisions that kill people. Second claim, we should not play God. Um, well, this is always an odd claim. People throw this around. What do you mean playing God? Uh, we, is making any decision that affects who lives and who dies uh, playing God? Well, then vaccinating people is playing God. Getting medicine is playing God. Uh, Having glasses is playing God, because God made me with bad eyes, so clearly God intended me to go stumbling around not being able to see. Uh, and you are playing God if you do anything to counteract it. Nobody believes that, so this playing God is too uh, vague a concept. You have to be narrower. You have to say exactly what kind of playing God is bad and why is it bad. Um, yeah, any transplants is playing God, but we do transplants all the time. Uh, third one is the important one. Killing is worse than letting die. There is a diff this is uh, halfway down page, first column on page 681. But um, in response, this is just to assert this is no good. You have to say why killing is worse than letting die. Um, and isn't inaction just a, a course of action? Um, the next article after John Harris that I didn't uh, that I didn't have you read by James Rachels contains a very famous argument against this distinction uh, and it's in the context of euthanasia. Because euthanasia, or mercy killing, uh, is where the distinction between killing and life, 
letting die really comes up because um, if you have someone brain dead on a ventilator, uh, can you unplug them? People, some people say, no, if you unplug them, you're killing them. But you can let them die. Well, what does that mean? Letting them die means possibly not feeding them. Uh, and what Rachel says is that's much more cruel than simply uh, terminating them. And he gives an example of uh, a case where you're babysitting your young relative and you're an evil person. And you know that if your young relative dies, you will come into a lot of money. You'll, you'll inherit their money. And you're in charge of giving them their bath. And uh, while they're having their bath, they slip and crack their head. Now, you were planning on killing them anyway. You were planning on drowning them in the bath. But they slip and crack their head and they fall under and they're unconscious and they're going to drown. And you say, great, now I don't have to do anything. And you just happily watch them go glug, glug, glug and die. Um, if you've seen Breaking Bad, there's a, a similar scene to this where Walt wants to get rid of Jesse's girlfriend and he watches her basically choke on her own vomit and doesn't do anything. Um, this is one of the first signs that Walt is going bad. Uh, and I think the, the implication is it's just as bad as if he killed her. And that's what Rachel wants to argue, that you are just as bad if you stand there and watch your cousin drown, even though you didn't do anything, because you should save them. Uh, and of course, so, but, but part of the whole point is to, the part of the whole point of the survival lottery is to question the idea that killing is as bad as letting die. So as, he, as Harris says, it's just begging the question. That is, um, what you have to do is show, what Y and Z are saying is, show me why killing is worse than letting die. And if you just say killing is worse than letting die because killing is worse than letting die, then you're not proving that killing is worse than letting die, you're assuming it. And that's what begging the question means. It means claiming to prove something by simply assuming it. So it's as if I said, uh, I, I, the Bible is literal truth. Um, why? Because it's the word of God. How do you know God exists? Because it says so in the Bible. Um, that's an example of circular reasoning, which is kind of a, a form of begging the question, because at no point do you prove anything. Each one rely, each assumes the other. You prove that God exists by assuming that God exists. Um, now, of course, God perfectly well might exist, but you haven't proved it by by that maneuver. And it might be true that killing is worse than letting die, but you still have to prove it. And you don't do it by just stating it. Fourth objection that they consider. It makes too high a demand on us. We don't have to be saints to give up our lives when we want uh, to live. For example, we have the right to self-defense. We can kill people. Um, we can kill people to keep us alive. Um, and what Y and Z can say is, well, they have the same right too. Uh, they have a right of self-defense. And as he said, as uh, Harris says, of course, there is something paradoxical about basing objections to the lottery scheme on the right of self-defense, because each person would have a better chance of living to a ripe of old age if the lottery scheme was implemented. So if you want a right of self-defense, it's to keep you alive. But the lottery scheme does a better job of keeping you alive than if we don't have the lottery scheme. You're likely to live. You're improving your chances of living. Um, the lottery will create too much terror in, in distress. Well, maybe. Um, but education should cure that. There's various, um, there's a famous short story by the person who wrote The Haunting of Hill House, Shirley Jackson, called The Lottery, uh, which illustrates, it's, it's supposed to be dystopian, but it's a story of a town that has a lottery that involves someone getting killed. And, but in this case, it's not for obviously good reason. Uh, and clearly they've accepted it. And people accept all kinds of things. The Aztecs accepted uh, human sacrifice. People will accept a lot of things. You just have to educate them. 
Uh, and it's for a good reason. It's for people living longer. So why not be educated in that way? Third parties cannot decide who to save and who to kill. That's the sixth, sixth uh, or seventh in my count objection. Um, since Y and Z cannot survive, since they are going to die in any event, there is no harm in putting their names in the lottery. Uh, for the chance of their dying cannot thereby increase and would almost certainly be reduced. Goes this objection, but. Um, what Y and Z say is, first of all, if their lottery scheme is adopted, they're not going to die anyway. You're just saying, we would allow them to die anyway, which Y and Z said would be bad. And um, uh, also there's the questions, of how far off must death be for it to be classified as dying? Um, so to assume that people are going to die is just to ignore medical uh, ignore medical advances. Why and Z say, we could be saved. It's like saying, oh, um, grandpa's got a cold, of course, or, or grandpa's got pneumonia. Uh, now, that could be cleared up by antibiotics, but if we leave him, he's going to die. So he's going to die. Well, if you leave him, but, you know, you we have antibiotics, we have a way of saving them. So Y and Z says, you're saying that we're going to die anyway, but only if you don't do what we suggest. So um, that's the uh, that's the number of uh, objections to uh, the survival lottery. Um, the he considers a couple more, like he says. Uh, Y and Z are bad because they have malevolent intent. They intend to kill this innocent lottery winner. Um, but Y and Z can reply that the death of the lottery winner is no part of their plan. They merely used they, they merely wish to use a couple of his organs. And if he cannot live without them, that's not their fault. None would be more delighted than Y and Z if artificial organs could do as well. So their that their intent is not to kill him. Their intent is just to, for them to survive. But it might require killing, just like uh, the cave example, the caving example. Um, we should kill the guy who's blocking the hole. We don't want to kill him, and that's not our intent. We're not doing it because we want to kill him. We're doing it because we want to save the people who are going to drown underground if we don't. So you can't call us evil for wanting to do this. We're only doing this because it's the way to save people. And uh, last one is the principle of common decency, um, that it is just macabre to consider this. Oh, it's just awful to consider such a thing. Um, y and Z just say their calculations are not macabre, and in fact are the most humane course available in the uh, circumstances. And if you talk about things being awful, uh, you've just got a closed mind. People said that about using corpses for medical school. Uh, that's why Burke and Hare managed to get their trade going, because people were said, oh, it's just disgusting, allowing corpses to be cut up by medical students. Oh, we can't have that. Now, of course, we do it all the time. Why? Because it makes sense. But certainly, it seems pretty gruesome um, having dead people cut up by medical students, and they probably make fun of the corpses most of the time. Um, and, and other uses of corpses are like in CSI labs, where they just lay corpses out to see how long it takes them to rot and see what insects lodge in their cavities. That's disgusting, but we allow it because it's useful and it allows us to solve murders because we then work out because the corpse had this particular bug in it, that bug only arrives after three weeks, so the, the uh, corpse is at least three weeks old. That seems to be a very undignified use of a dead person. But hey, it's a good effect, and that's what Y and Z would say about this. Just because their idea makes you squeamish, that's not an argument against it. All right, so a couple of interesting readings there, and we will talk m more about death next time when we read Judith Jarvis Thompson's article on abortion. <laughs>